PhotoShelter is the leader in online portfolio websites and tools for professional photographers. We help you get business, do business, and keep business. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Alan Murabayashi speaking to you from the PhotoShelter World Headquarters here in New York City. We have a fantastic webinar for you today, chock full of information. I know a lot of you out there obviously use uh, Adobe Photoshop, Lightroom, registered trademark, etc., cetera, um, and, uh, as do I. And uh, we have the guy who knows everything about everything uh, on that product. But before we start, a few housekeeping notes. Over to the right of your screen, you should see a go-to webinar control panel. And from that panel, you can ask us questions as we go along. Uh, we have uh, our lovely uh, uh, Sarah Jacobs answering questions for you, and we're also going to intersperse some of the popular questions into the conversation. And if you're one of those people that loves to tweet, you can tweet with the hashtag PSWebinar as well, uh, and follow us at PhotoShelter. And with that, let me introduce you to the man from Arizona. If, if, if you've ever been to any conference and you've seen kind of discussions of Lightroom, it's very likely that, that Jared Platt... Uh, was the guy talking to you. So Jared, welcome uh, uh, from Arizona. Thanks. Good to be here. How did good you to, get... Good to be in New York from... <laughs> Virtually from here. sunny, sunny... Uh, where am I? Arizona. Uh, Arizona, yeah. Yes, thank you. How, how did you initially get into Lightroom and into the, the education of that? And, and how much did that kind of change your own personal workflow? Actually, the... Uh, the impetus for getting into Lightroom was purely as a backlash um, against uh, Aperture. So I uh, originally I started working uh, as a digital photographer back before digital cameras were any good, and before before Photoshop or Bridge could even see a a, a raw file. But I I refused to shoot a JPEG, so I was always working in Nikon software, yeah. which was and is awful. Yeah. I mean, it, it was just horrible software. And so it took me like, I would have to, I had a bed in my studio that I would sleep in for 20 minutes. And then I would get up and do something else with the software. And then I'd wait for it to render that thing. And then I would get up again. And I would just, every 20 minutes, I would wake up and toggle the next thing that needed to be done in order to process an entire wedding in RAW. It was awful. It's and, kind of uh, hard to believe what life was like before we had Lightroom and, and Aperture and those and these workflow tools. Right, right. So, so then at, at one point, um, Bridge could see RAW, and so I started working in Bridge and Camera RAW, and then I saw uh, Aperture come out, and I and at the time I was teaching college, and I told the students in the in my uh, photo class, I said Aperture is going to change the way we work on photographs. Um, because it, you know, it purported to be this amazing software, and uh, so I went out and bought it for six hundred dollars the first time it came yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I promptly returned it a week later, and and uh, they were it was such a bad version that they were taking it back. They 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 instructed Apple instructed them to take any anybody that brought their software back take it back. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so I got my so my money back. And then I, um, I heard through the grapevine that there was an Adobe version of this thing coming out, and I got the beta. And I started working the beta, and uh, and it, it, the beta would every time the beta came up, it would say, "Warning: Don't use this. Could destroy your house." You know, <laughs> it was like it was like this big warning sign: "Don't use this. We have no idea what it'll do to your photos." <laughs> right. And uh, and I said. <laughs> to hell with that! I'm gonna do it anyway. So I just I would I would take my images and I would copy them before I brought them into Lightroom, and then I would use them in Lightroom. And I have not had one problem with Lightroom since the beta. Wow. So yeah. anyway, I, I I it was awesome. I, I it changed just from going from uh from from Adobe Camera Raw and Bridge to Lightroom increased my speed by about 50%. So literally, I mean, I cut my workflow in half. It's amazing. Just by just by changing programs and then as I started to develop techniques inside of the software, um, you know, things improved vastly beyond that. So for those of you who don't know, uh, you can check out 
Jared's work at platphotography.com. And then Jared also has a bunch of Lightroom plugins and he does workshops all over the world and online with Creative Live and a whole bunch of other uh, companies. And Jared Platt Workshops, is it plural? Workshops.com? It is. That's uh, where they can find you. So we're just looking at some of uh, Jared's work here. He does a lot of uh, wedding and children portraiture, et cetera. And, and obviously a lot of time as an educator as well. Yeah, so Jared, I, we're, I, uh, we're immediately getting some questions about whether today is going to be kind of strictly focused on Lightroom 5 or whether the people using 4 will find some applicability. You know, almost everybody will find applicability because we're talking about the concept of creating a usable portfolio inside of Lightroom. And uh, most of the things that we'll discuss are available even in Lightroom 2. Um, there's a couple things like published services and collections that have been revamped and, and added in 3, 4, and then 5. So there may be some places where people will wish they had 5. But in most cases, if you have 4, you'll be pretty well uh, able to do anything we're talking about. If you have 3, you really need to stop living in the past anyway. So. <laughs> That's good advice for life as well. Yeah, right. Move right. on, Go. young man. Um, That's right. If, you, if you're still living in the 80s, time right. to update. Uh, we are recording this, so in case there's some you know, quick move that the pros are making on your screen, you can always go back uh, to our blog tomorrow at blog.photoshelter.com and watch it, and we'll also be emailing you out so you know that. I'm going to turn over the screen now uh, to Jared, and as I do that, I should let you know, uh, in terms of expectation setting, we're not going to be talking about pixel editing today. So if you're looking for how to dodge and make the colors really saturated, that's going to be another workshop, or you can check out his, his workshops or his online recordings. Today, we're really talking about the organization of your online and print portfolios, the things you want to collect to make your stuff look the best to your clients. So with that, I'm going to send the screen over to Jared now, and uh, he's going to take over control. Let me know when you can see. And we can see now. Perfect. Okay. So, um, thank you, Alan. Um, so it, it's it's good to be here with Photo Shelter, and I and I'm glad to have so many of you out there. Um, this is an important topic, and I I don't get to talk about this topic all that much. Um, so it's one of my favorite topics to talk about, kind of off off the grid. Usually when I'm talking at WPPI or some big conference. Um, I'm usually talking about speed increases in workflow and things like that, which is a really important thing, but I don't think that people pay enough attention to their portfolio and how um, they can not only increase their productivity and their speed inside of selecting images in their portfolio, but just how to manage that. So that's what we're going to do here today. Um, I am inside of what I call my Lightroom portfolio. Um, so you can see that we're starting from 2000. So this is the portfolio that starts in 2000. And you can see that these are scans. Um, and then all the way down to uh, 2013 uh, portfolio work. So there's, there's a lot of years of work in here. And I think that the total number right now is at 46,818 images. So it's a lot of imagery. Um, but... And, and, and one of the things you'll notice about Lightroom is that it slows down as you get more and more images inside of it. Um, so one could make the argument that it's very difficult to work inside of Lightroom if you just keep adding to a particular catalog. Um, but when it comes to your portfolio catalog, uh, you want everything that you could possibly be looking for inside of that catalog but that doesn't mean that you need to have every image that you have created in your life inside of that catalog. Um, so what happens is I, as I'm working on a particular job, will go through and choose one, two, three, four, and five star images. And, and once I've selected the images that I really like, those are the ones that I want to put into my, into my portfolio. So, so there's kind of a hierarchy of images there's the there's the the images that you're going to reject and obviously you don't want to show those to anybody not even to your client not even you don't even want to see them yourself you're almost depressed when you see them um, and so then it's the pick images that you could possibly put into a portfolio but even at just the pick level so the ones that have no stars but you've picked them 
and the client has to see them because they have to have choices or whatever. Um, those don't even need to go into your portfolio because they're not all that interesting. So I would never show, say, I would never try and get my images published in a magazine if they were just okay enough to show the client. Um, the only ones that I want to show to a magazine or to a vendor or to potential clients are the really uh, good images, the ones that are better than others. And, and, and I typically will choose only the very best and then I choose other ones for educational purposes. So I actually have two purposes for my mm. portfolio. So that's one interesting. Is, You're using uh, the, the flagged as pick or the, the P is the shortcut for that as just kind of right. the, so, the bottom selection the, mechanism. That's right. Yeah. So if it if, if it's not selected at all, then it's a then it's that's a, a that's a reject. So if I haven't touched any keys, then it's rejected. If I hit the P key, it becomes a pick and that means the client gets to see it, um, but no one else in the world gets to see it. And then if the if it gets a one star or above, that means that now I'm interested in it as a business. It's it's a it's a viable option for me to use for my business or for marketing purposes or or for teaching purposes. Um, and and there are a lot of images that I have that like for instance I have a folder called everybody sucked once. And so these are images and and stupid things that I've done throughout my life that are just awful. So like this is an art project <laughs> I did at one point and they're just they're horrible things. And so <laughs> it doesn't doesn't mean that they have to always be good. They could be awful things as well. Um, but for me it's teaching purposes. So I have a lot of things that I need to present to people even though they're not good or maybe it's a before after or maybe it's a build up to something. So so I have more images in my portfolio than most people would. Um, because I use a lot for instructional purposes. But regardless of what the purpose is of your portfolio, um, in the end, the only images that you need to collect and to sort through are the images that are valuable to you as a business or as an artist. Um, those are the images that need to be collected, put into the portfolio. And if you have done your homework, if you've done things right, it won't be very difficult to find those images inside of your portfolio, no matter how big it is, um, because you will have compartmentalized those images into smaller subsets. And for me, you can see that it's designed into years. So there's you know a thousand images in 2003. Um, there's 2,000 images in 2005. So there's different amounts of images in different years. Um, but if you click on just one year, so in 2013, we're only looking at 500 so far. So that's a pretty small set of images to have to go through. So Lightroom's going to, once it once you've chosen a folder to look at, Lightroom can kind of forget about the other images and only work on those. So you, it doesn't it doesn't make the, the portfolio all that big um, once you start collecting them into smaller groups. And that's why you want to divide images into folders not because you need to find them uh, via folders. Folders are actually an old antiquated way of finding images. Um, for instance, I can go into, if I clicked on all of my images, so my entire portfolio throughout my life, um, and I were to just, it doesn't matter what I'm looking at, and, and I were to click on uh, metadata, I could then sort um, by metadata for raw images that were shot in 2013 and you know so it, and then it looks like I've got some other categories uh, going on as well but uh, probably attributes there's some stars that are going on um, different flags so I could choose you know any kind of image that was shot then and then I can turn off any kind of textual um, options and so, so I can sort by a lot of different options um, so I can find things based on keywords, based on dates, based on what camera or lens shot it. So all of that's available to me. I don't necessarily need that to find images. So I mean, I don't necessarily need folders to find images. So the the purpose of a folder in a portfolio is just to kind of segregate the images such that there it's a smaller group of images that you're looking at. Um, so that you're not slowing down Lightroom as you go. When you uh, uh, 
in jest and you do your first pass of pics and, and stars, are you deleting any images? Yes. When I, when I first ingest my images into Lightroom as a job, and so let's, let's quit out of, of the portfolio for a moment and let's go to, so I have two different catalogs that I work with on a regular basis. The first catalog is the portfolio catalog and the second catalog is the working catalog uh -huh. or vice versa. So when I open up my working catalog, you're going to see the jobs that I'm currently working on. So here's a wedding that I just finished and I've got a series of images that are done. So what happens is you ingest the images, you do your sorting, you flag the images that you want to use, uh, you star the images that you think that are valuable to you beyond just showing to the client. And then once you've done all that work, then all of the rejects just disappear. So we're going to just delete all the rejects. We have no interest in them. Hmm. Now, for me, that means that I, I segregate them into their own folder, and then I throw them into a hard drive called rejects, um, by the same name as the job. So it would say, you know, 2013-07-22 client wedding. Yeah. So that would be in a rejects drive. So that I've got about six months before I have to kind of get rid of that one to make room for a new set of rejects. Gives me a chance to have the client come back and say, hey, you're missing a file or something that I know you shot, um, which very, very rarely happens. I, I think it's happened twice in my career. And... I've been shooting weddings for 15 years now. And so twice I've had somebody come back and ask to see some more images. But um, what happens then is once you've got the images that you want to share with your portfolio, and I'm not going to share all of the images, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to take, say, this one image here. Um, I really like this image. I think it's an interesting shot. Um, I like the treatment that was done to it. So if this was the only image that I found interesting and useful um, inside of this wedding itself, then I would export this image um, as a portfolio piece. So as I'm kind of finalizing my job, um, as I'm, you know, I've, I've got the job here, I've got all the images that I'm using, whether they're internal images of me shooting or whether they're, you know, images of the bride and groom, um, those images are going to first be keyworded. You can see over here there's a bunch of keywords. Um, keywording is, is crucial, and I'll actually show you a little bit on keywording a little bit later when we're inside of the portfolio. Um, but suffice it to say, all of your images that you're going to send to your portfolio need to be heavily keyworded so that you can find them. Um, so once you've, once you've created the keywords inside of the images and you start them, um, once you have keywords, stars, flags, um, that's pretty much all you need to be able to then find them very easily inside of your portfolio. Um, but the key is if you don't keyword your images at the job level as part mm -hmm. of the job, you'll never do it in the portfolio. <laughs> right. It just won't happen. And so then you'll be what I like to call surfing for images. So you'll just be scrolling through image after image after image, and the process of being your portfolio will be a sheer waste of your time. Yeah. And that's a problem. You don't want to be wasting your time every time you need to go find images. For instance, if you um, say there's a opportunity for someone uh, – uh, whether it's publication or whether it's a vendor or whatever it happens to be, they call you and say, hey, we saw this image or whatever, and we'd like to see more images like that for a publication or for a, you know, corporate job or for, you know, an art project or whatever it happens to be. If you have to spend the next 20 or 30 hours searching your portfolio for those things because you don't know where anything is and you think it might have been 2013 but you're not sure maybe it was 2006 you have no idea you're you're going to lose a lot of jobs as a result of that yeah because it's going to take you too long um i lost a really prime opportunity many many years ago back when i was shooting film because i didn't have my film cataloged quite right and so when a company that uh, that was printing like the 
the framed prints for IKEA, you know, that mm -hmm. people go and buy and put yeah. on their walls. Um, they called me and asked me for images because they saw some of the work that I'd done over in Sweden. And they were like, hey, we want, we want to use some of these images for our framed prints. And I said, oh, okay. So I, I went in and started finding images and pulling them and scanning them and getting them ready. And by the time I was done doing that, they had already gone to press and I was out. And I didn't yeah. get the job. I didn't get the, the proceeds of selling the prints because it took me too long to get the images together. So that's the that's the... That's the negative side of not being prepared, um, but the positive side of being prepared is that you know a, a vendor called or a location calls me and says, "Hey, we want to put some images of, you know, some of the weddings you've done here on this wall that the brides are going to see. Can you deliver, you know, some prints?" Yeah, absolutely. I just need to go to the portfolio, type in the name of the location, and then that I want a bride and some flowers in the picture gotcha. and I, I, they were just delivered to me in the snap of a finger and I'm able to then print those out and bring them over to them. Within two days I've got prints hanging on a wall right? and, and all the other photographers are, are, aren't even on the wall because they take forever to deliver their images to a client when they need them. Now, I noticed that you're shooting raw. There's, I see a lot of DNG files, but mm -hmm. it looks like a lot of the ones that you've exported to your portfolio catalog are actually TIFFs. So are you uh, doing the post-processing from this workbook and then exporting the final image to the portfolio, assuming that you're not going to do any sort of pixel editing in the portfolio? Okay, so um, there's... There's rules, at least in my mind, about what goes to a portfolio. And so here's the rules. Once you've done all of your editing, you've selected all your images, you've adjusted all of your images, you've keyworded all your images, once you've done all of that, um, at that point I turn everything that's raw to a DNG. So the DNG is, the reason I want a DNG is because then everything's baked into the DNG. The keywords, the adjustments, all that stuff is inside the DNG. Even though it's still a raw file, um, it, it, all the stuff that, need, that I need to search that or to use it in some other program like Bridge or Camera Raw, all of that's available inside the DNG, which means that I'm able to go just to my spotlight here and type in, Grand Canyon, uh, Canyon, oops, Canyon Wedding, and I can find if I show all here, I can find a whole bunch of DNGs that are Grand Canyon Wedding stuff because I have put the, I have made the file into a DNG, and so now my, all of my images are searchable anywhere and everywhere on my computer, even mm -hmm. if I don't have uh, Lightroom installed or let's say you know I haven't imported them all into a catalog as a as a, a portfolio catalog even at that point I could go into bridge and do a cross search across my entire computer for all all of my images that have you know the following words in them and have you know whatever kind of rating on them and and even bridge will deliver it and Bridge will show me what they look like after they've been adjusted, even though they're still raw. Right, so right. I want all of my images to be a DNG. Then the next rule is only the best images go to the go to the portfolio. And if they've been edited, that's a bad way to say that. Edited. I, I think I said edited. <laughs> um, if they've been edited, then they are a TIFF or a PSD. So uh, for instance, here's an image um, that was a DNG here, but there was a little bit of retouching done to it, and so she becomes a TIFF. So because I had some editing to do, the TIFF is what's going to make its way over to the portfolio. The DNG is not necessarily going to make it there, unless I see it as a valuable teaching tool, and then for nice. me, I would send it. If I wasn't a teacher, um, then I, I would only send the TIFF to the portfolio because it's the only image that I want to work. I don't want to work on the original RAW again because I've already retouched it. So a lot it's of people, always the latest iteration of the file that should go to the portfolio. A lot of people are asking, why don't you import as DNG versus import as RAW and then convert? 
Um, that's a really good question. If you didn't, uh, I mean, you can do it either way. It's just that if I'm shooting, say, 4,000 images and I'm only keeping 400, it's easier to convert 400 images than wait for five or 4,000 to be converted. Gotcha. So that's it. That's the only reason. It's just speed. It's, it's less things to convert. Yeah. So I'm able to quickly bring in images, start working on them, and uh, convert them later once I've selected them. So um, again, let's let's pretend then we're going to send some images over to the portfolio. So I'm going to go back down to this image, and because it's it's a a, a worked on TIFF that was actually done in um, Alien Skins Exposure 5 software is what did some of this work, um, some of the flare work and stuff. Here's the original file. That's what it originally looked like. I ran it through a plugin, and that's the end work on it. Um, so this is the one I want to send out. This one doesn't need to be sent out because it's not going to be something that goes to any kind of magazine or anything like that. Um, and then I'm going to export. So what I do is I sort for all the images that I want to export to my portfolio. Um, and you can kind of choose what that's going to be, whether it's two star, three star. You kind of have to figure out what it is that makes that litmus test as to whether or not it's worth going to the portfolio. Um, so you, you find out what that is. You highlight all those images, and those images are the ones that are going to go to the portfolio. And for me, I have a preset that I've created um, called Portfolio Original Images. And the Portfolio Original Images, you'll notice... Um, up here in the top, and I know this is a little small. Let me see if I have my, I don't have, hold on, can you bear with me for one second? Yep. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to the preferences, and I think it's in, uh, maybe it's in the mouse, not in the mouse. There we go. I think that does it. All right. Let me see. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So you can see in this export location that the, the preset has toggled a specific folder, which it sent it to Portfolio 13, which is the drive, to the Portfolio drop box. And that's where it's going to drop all of my new files that I want to deliver to the portfolio. Um, so the idea being that every time you want to send something to the portfolio, if you just touch the preset that you've created, it's going to send it to the right disk, to the right place. It's going to give it the right file name. And the file name is important, actually. You'll notice that it says file name, date, time. What that does is it creates a really, really unique file name that can never be uh, duplicated. So 0437 is the name of the file. That's the name of my image. This is the date that it was shot, and this is the hour, the minute, and the second it was shot. Hmm. So there's no way that that's ever going to be replicated in any job across the rest of my life which means that I can throw all of these images, whether they're from 2013 or 2012 or 2010, all in the same folder, and there will never be an overriding duplicating name problem. So that's the, whenever I send something to the portfolio, the name changes so that it has the file name, the date, and the time that it was shot. The reason I don't put like a client name on it or something like that is because if I'm sending it out on the web or whatever I'm doing with it, I don't necessarily want the client's name attached right. to the file. I, it's just kind of a, I would just hate for their name to be all around and, you know, there's people that aren't interested in their face being shown all over the place or whatever, especially with their name attached to it. Um, so if you go to the image format, you have a lot of options. You could send it out as a DNG or a PSD or a TIFF or a JPEG but I'm going to send out the original. And the reason I say the original is that then no matter what I'm sending out, if it's TIFF, it's a DNG, if it's a CR2, whatever it is, it's going to go out as the original item. Um, 
if it sends out a CR2, it'll also send out an XMP sidecar file with all the details in it. Mm -hmm. But remember, I'm turning everything to a DNG and to a TIFF or a PSD, so those are the only things that are going out. Anytime, if there's ever a JPEG in my portfolio, it's either from my iPhone or it's an accident. Right, and so part of that, I assume, is 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 a quality issue for you. You don't want JPEG compression on these portfolio images. Right. You want the absolute best file in the portfolio yeah. so that then whatever iterations you make from it are the very best from the inception of the image. Because there will still be, you'll still do some stuff to your uh, images once they hit your portfolio, especially if you're just kind of finishing the files and sending them out as DNGs. Um, when you come to do some kind of a major, you know, retrospective piece or something like that, you'll probably go back and adjust the DNG a little bit to match other ones, and you'll probably do a little retouching on it, things like that. So those kind of things can still happen in the in the portfolio. So you really need to maintain quality control over that portfolio. And what sort of color space are we outputting to, knowing that we don't necessarily know the final output destination of these portfolio images? Okay, so always when I make a TIFF or a PSD, it's going out as a Pro Photo RGB. Uh, I'm sorry, a Pro Photo, um, a Pro Photo color space, 16-bit color space hmm. um, as a PSD or a TIFF, uncompressed if it's a TIFF. Um, so I don't want any compression on the file. I don't want any compression on the color space, and I want the best bit depth I can get. Mm -hmm. If I'm sending it out as raw, for all intents and purposes, there is no color space. It's a raw color space. It right. just kind of doesn't even exist. Um, and so I can work with it uh, to my heart's content. So I, I would prefer to send everything out as a DNG and never have to go to a TIFF. Um, but if I do have to go into Photoshop or a plugin to edit it, then I'm going to have to go to a TIFF or a PSD. So at that point, I just choose the very best PSD or TIFF I can get. And if you're going to take that TIFF and then print it large scale and, and hang it on a wall and, and, the, and the, the printing device has an ICC profile, are you going to go back into Photoshop and assign that profile and do a, do a soft proof on that? Or, or how, how, do you bypass that step? Uh, typically speaking, I, I print to either photographic printers or the inkjet printer in my, in my office. So um, if I'm doing any printing, it's to those. So all I have to do is send it to an sRGB color space gotcha. to send it out somewhere. Otherwise, I'm printing it directly from Lightroom. So Photoshop is unnecessary when it comes to that. Um, but there's the soft proofing option inside of Lightroom is perfectly viable for for seeing what it's going to look like when it goes to any particular color space mm -hmm. or printer. So that's where I would use it. I, for me, Lightroom is this hub where all activity comes, it, all activity happens within Lightroom and around Lightroom. So Photoshop isn't, isn't the place that I work. Photoshop is just simply a plug-in to Lightroom. Gotcha. So, okay, so we're gonna export this file to the portfolio Dropbox with this new file name and it's going to be the original file. So all these other file options kind of disappear as a result of that. And uh, when I export that, it's going to send that one image. And it doesn't take very long because all it's doing is literally going to that file and making a copy of it and throwing it onto another drive. So it's just copying the file over. So once I've done that, once I've finished up a job and I'm going to... Um, to finalize the job and kind of archive the job, the next thing I do right before I archive the job, or the very first thing, the last thing I do before I archive the job is highlight all of my favorite images, usually like three star and above or something like that. Highlight all of those and go to the export, choose portfolio originals and hit export. That's all you have to do. It doesn't take very long to do it, so you might as well get it done um, as part of the job. So once you've done that, then you, you don't have to immediately go to your portfolio. So I'm going to open up the portfolio here and go to my portfolio Dropbox, and you'll see that there's one image in here, and that's the image that we just created. And I can let this thing fill up for days or months or however long I want. I don't necessarily have to go look at that thing all the time um, because 
I can just keep filling it up. That naming structure allows me to fill it up with whatever happens to be there. And I don't just have to go from Lightroom. I could also, if I find that I have another file somewhere on my desktop that I want to put into the portfolio, and somehow it's circumvented Lightroom, I can just grab the file and drag it into this folder. And just keep adding images to this folder. Then what you're going to do is you're going to go back to your uh, portfolio and you're going to create a completely different catalog. And if, if those of you have never created a catalog at all, you've just used whatever Lightroom gave you in the beginning, if you hold down, let me quit this and go back. If you, when, you're, when you open up Lightroom, if you hold down the Option or the Alt key and keep it held down while you're waiting for this to open, it will open up this dialog box that allows you to select what catalog you're going to open. And so I can either select my working catalog, my portfolio catalog, and if you don't have a portfolio catalog, you can just simply create a new catalog and call it your portfolio catalog. And the place that I would put that is inside of your pictures folder. So your pictures folder is a great place for your Lightroom catalog. So there they are. Here's my Lightroom 5 catalog. Here's my portfolio catalog. And so this is the catalog that it would be opening. If I go over here, hold down the Option or the Alt key, wait for it to give me the dialog box, and choose that portfolio database. So once I open up the portfolio, then it's, at this point, anytime I open up the portfolio, I want to see what's inside of this portfolio Dropbox. So there's two ways to accomplish this. The first way is to right-click that Dropbox and, and synchronize that folder. Now, if you haven't ever imported that, um, like, for instance, I could just remove this folder so that we, if this is the way your portfolio looked and you'd never created a portfolio Dropbox, then you would go to the Import dialog box here, and you would go to your portfolio drive, and click on that portfolio Dropbox, and then you would hit import because it's synchronizing or it's looking for anything that's inside that portfolio Dropbox. And now all of that, that is now inside of my portfolio ready, ready to be used. And you can see that it's got its keywords here, it's got its star ratings, and it's because it's a TIFF, I can't go back to the original RAW. If it was a DNG, I could also go back to the original RAW. Now, that's the that's kind of the, the the manual way to update your portfolio. Remember, you're just kind of throwing stuff into this portfolio Dropbox for months, and then the next time you open up your portfolio, you have to remember to come over here and either import what's in that, or you can right-click it and synchronize the folder. So that's you can, you can right click this portfolio Dropbox and synchronize the folder and when you do that it then looks for any new images inside that folder and tells you whether or not there's anything new in there and then you can hit synchronize and it will just synchronize whatever else is new inside of that Dropbox. So that's another way to do it which is kind of a manual way to do it. But what I want to show you really quickly is just a, an automated way to do it. So if I were trying to automate the process what I would do is I would go to the file menu and I would go to the auto import settings and click on the auto import settings and here I would choose a folder that I want to watch. So I would, I'm going to have to create a new fake folder here so that you can see it, but I would go to my portfolio catalog uh, drive and I would create a folder called port Portfolio Dropbox. I'm going to call that three because I've got other ones. So that's Dropbox three, and hit choose. So now it's it's going to be looking at this watched folder, and then I'm going to tell it once you've got stuff. So once you see stuff in this folder, I want you to move it over to the Portfolio New Additions folder. So this is the Portfolio New Additions folder right here. I choose that and it's going to put it into a folder called to organize and, that, and by the way if you're going to do this you have to put it in a subfolder otherwise it won't work I don't know why but it just Lightroom 
forces you down the subfolder here. So you put two organizes the subfolder name, leave the file name as it is, don't change any of this stuff here because you, you just want to bring it in as it is, and hit OK. Once you've done that, then let's just hide Lightroom for a second, and I'm going to go to the portfolio. If I take the portfolio, there's the portfolio Dropbox 3. So that's Dropbox 3 that you're looking at there. And if I go to uh, this one, so I've got a, if this is a bunch of images that I wanted to put inside of Lightroom, I could highlight all those images and simply grab them and drag them over into that folder. Or I could export them from Lightroom. And look what happens. Immediately, Lightroom starts importing all these images. So every time you open Lightroom, it'll just automatically look to that folder and start importing all of these images, and you're, you're good to go. You can start playing with it. So there's a DNG um, that we have, and it's got all of its keywords on it, and it could go back to its original if, if necessary. So, and they're all going into this folder right here called To Organize. You can see Portfolio New Editions, To Organize. That's where it's going. And then your job, every time you um, open up your portfolio and images start coming in, your job then is to take those images and put them where they belong, in the, into the year or the style of photography or whatever it is that you organize. Some people organize their images based on the type of image they are, wedding, portrait, whatever. I just organize mine by year because the keywords tell me what they are. So that's that's the way to automate a portfolio in a very simple way. Um, any questions out there about that? Um, yeah. So just as as a clarification of term. You know, typically when when I think of portfolio and a lot of people think of portfolio, it's kind of like my 30 best images and three galleries that I throw up on my website. But it seems like the way you're using it is these are sort of my, for lack of a better term, commercially viable images that correct I might go right, to when a client has a request. Right. Your portfolio is anything impressive you've ever done. Uh -huh. What you show to the world should be a very minute set or subset of that portfolio. Mm -hmm. Your portfolio is everything that you've shot that's worthwhile, um, that's commercially viable. And then and then beyond that, whatever it is you want to show to the world, then that's a question of, okay, how do I how do I take the images that I've been working on? How do I take those and share them? And so let's talk about that for just a second. And and since we happen to be talking um, to Photo Shelter, um, Photo Shelter's uh, uh, publish service, which is basically a collection is a smart or a, uh, it's not real, it's a virtual folder where you can put things. Um, and a publish service is also a virtual folder where you can put things. But the difference is, is that a publish service has the ability then to, con to connect to a service of some sort. So for instance, if I wanted to um, grab an image, just let's say this guy um, here playing the violin. I want to take him and I want to put him onto my portfolio um, site on Photo Shelter. I simply grab him and drag him to the wedding portfolio folder inside of my Photo Shelter archive. And now he's there. And when I click on that, you can see that these are images that are published up on the website right now. This is one that was modified that needs to be republished, and this is a new one that needs to be published. When I hit publish, all of those, this goes into activity. Um, it goes in and, and decides, okay, what do I need to publish, and what do I need to, and when you set it up, you get to choose what do you want to publish. You could publish the original image, you could publish a JPEG, you could publish, and that's one of the things about Photo Shelter that's different from other services like that is that you can you can upload a TIFF and that's deliverable to clients and things like that which right. you know it's not just a JPEG delivery um, it certainly could be a TIFF or a PSD or something like that um, so anyway it's publishing right now and if I grab my I'm 
here's my photo shelter account right here and if I go to this uh, my images here and I'm just gonna re um, fresh this screen so now I can just scan through all these images and at the end is this guy right there so he was just published and then then the other one that was changed was where is this no not that guy maybe that no yeah, it, was it was that, that guy. guy yeah it was that guy yeah. so this guy was changed and i don't even remember what was changed it may have been a keyword was changed on him or maybe i don't i don't know what exactly what i did but anyway that's the that's the speed at which a portfolio then can publish Um, whether it's hard drive or whether it's on you know Facebook and, and you can do this on Facebook as well so I could take an image right now and deliver that up to Facebook and then you guys could be going and looking at it immediately um, so all of that's available but collections are a really important tool in finding images so if I were to say okay I want to look for a specific uh, item then the, the appropriate way to look for something is to start in the collections. I mean, if you knew exactly when it was shot, you could just simply go look for the year and find the date and, and get it. But if you're looking for something for a vendor or for a publication, just go to the collections and create, you start with a smart collection. And so in that collection, and really you, you ought to start with a collection set so that you it kind of collects everything together. So you would say, I'm looking for... Um, uh, photo shelter demo. So that just lets you know, okay, we're in the photo shelter demo, and that's where we're going to include our smart um, collection. And our smart collection, let's say we're looking for uh, landscape images. So if I'm looking for landscape images, I'm going to put it inside of this demo. It's a smart collection, which means it's intelligently looking for these. So I'm going to make sure that the rating is more than two stars, and I'm going to then also look. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I'm going to look for uh, file name or type or what you know whatever I'm looking for so any searchable text I don't want to do any searchable text usually because sometimes there are the the name landscape might be in other places that mm -hmm. I don't suspect it so instead I want to do it inside of the other metadata which would be the keywords because keywords then I can say okay I'm looking for something that's landscape right now that's different than if I was looking for um, items that are landscape orientation, right? Right. So, like you can you can look at you know the size of the image, or you can look at the uh, whether or not it's a landscape or a a portrait, you know, vertical or horizontal. Um, those things are are different. You can even look to see if like I, I like to do this to make sure it has adjustments on it. So sometimes you might have a DNG that doesn't have any adjustments on it. If it doesn't have any adjustments, I probably didn't do anything to it, so it's right. probably not ready to be dealt with. And, and if I want to deliver something today, then I don't want to have to work on it. So I only want to see it if it's been worked on. So, But then this will also mean that it won't deliver any TIFFs to me because those won't have adjustments. So you kind of have to pick and choose what you're going to do there. So if I do this and I say, okay, I just want landscape images that say landscape in them, um, and I hit create, now you can see I just got delivered all of the images that I've tagged landscape. So now, once I've done that, I can create another collection. This time I create a normal collection and just call it uh, photo shelter delivery images. So these are the ones that I want to deliver. I'm going to put it inside that same collection set. This time I'm going to I'm going to call it I'm going to set it as the target collection. When you set something as a target collection, it means that all you have to do is hit the B button 
in order to add it. So now I've got a small subset of images spanning across my entire um, portfolio. And I can just scan through and say, okay, what do I want to do? Well, I think I want to use this one. So if I click on it and hit the B key or just push on this little dot, it adds it to that photo shelter delivery image collection. And then I just scan, oh, I like this one. So I'm going to click on that one. I like uh, this one. Let's see what else. Is there anything else? That's This might be interesting. So I'm just grabbing stuff that visually sparks you know, my attention. And then, oh, look, there's, there's this one. This is not a landscape photo. But clearly, it was in the same maternity shoot, and it was just at the very end, and somehow it got tagged incorrectly. So if I shift-click all of those, go down to the uh, keyword area, and just go to landscape and outdoor. So I'm going to outdoor is clearly not correct. So I delete that. Um, and then I'm going to do landscape. That's not correct. So I'm going to delete that. And then when I hit enter, they disappear because they're no longer in the smart collection because mm -hmm. I just fixed something. So as I'm going through and sorting for things that I'm interested in, um, it's also a very good idea to utilize the time that you're in there to correct, um, you know, failings, things that are, you know, this is not a landscape. So come over here and double click landscape and delete it and hit enter and now that's gone. So I'm every time I look at my portfolio and every time I work on it, I'm honing further honing um, the the usefulness of the portfolio. And you're not so, really concerned that that's not updating in the in the working catalog because presumably you've pared it down already to be in the portfolio catalog. Right, yeah. I mean, in the working catalog, they're obviously those same errors are going to exist, and they're going to exist for eternity inside of the working catalog. Yeah. But I'm never going to be sorting or searching inside the working catalog because right. I'm done with those. Those are the only time I'll ever look inside of the the working catalog ever again in my life is if the client specifically is looking for something and asks me, you know, to go there. So once I've done my little selection here, then I go here, and now I've got a set of images that I can then deliver or sort through or play around with the order of them or whatever. Or I can highlight all of those images and go to my book module and start creating a book inside of the book module of you know a retrospective of landscape photos that I've taken over the last 10 years or however you want to do it. So... As a matter so the, of, I, of practicality, then, uh -huh. you know, at, at what point, you know, I think if you if you're a starting off as a photographer and you have maybe a thousand images in your entire catalog, then then maybe creating the difference between the working catalog and the portfolio cap catalog is seems like extra work uh, at a certain point. Um, but it'll but, you know, things like this will always seem like extra work uh -huh. to people who are not doing them already. Right. Um, because it is, it is extra work, but it's only once you get beyond the process of making it, once you've made it and you do the extra work, then when someone comes to you and says, Hey, do you have an image that has this and you can find it without having to go to five different jobs and look at this year's disc and then that year's disc and plug yeah. in five different discs and go to the and and just keep searching. Once you've, experience the speed and the quickness with which you can find something, the efficiency of doing it the right way, then it's no longer extra work. It's actually saved you time by doing the extra work. Yeah. And uh, the beauty of, of our industry is that most photographers are unorganized and lazy. <laughs> right. And, 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 and that's a value to me because because everybody's so unorganized and so lazy, I get ahead of everybody else because no one wants to do the work. No one right. wants to put in the extra effort at the front side of their job, and so they end up losing in the end. Whereas yeah. for me, yeah. I, I'm able to soar beyond those people because I'm willing to put in that little extra effort at the beginning. We're getting a lot of questions in regards to, you know, what sort of drives do you have hooked up to this thing? How are you doing backups? Can you can you address that really quickly? Yeah. Um, this is a quick 
view at my now I'm on a iMac. I'm on the 27 inch iMac with a three terabyte drive. So that's that's the system. Um, and so inside of my iMac, and it's interesting because I used to use a uh, a Mac Pro, but it got so old and slow, and they weren't coming out with a new Mac Pro right. for so long that I finally just said, all right, I'm going to go to an iMac. So it used to be that I had a whole bunch of different drives inside that iMac or that Mac Pro, but Fortunately for me, I didn't invest in the wrong system because the new Mac Pro also doesn't have a lot of drives in it. So everything is going to this kind of external drive system anyway. So what I did is I created my, so my jobs folder is here inside of the pictures folder. So these are the working jobs. These are the things that are being worked on currently. That whole set of drives is actually being backed up, and I, I don't have it plugged in right now because it makes a little noise, um, and so I don't want that to be on your. Uh, I, don't, I don't want that to be on your recording. Yep. Um, but all of that is being backed up constantly to a RAID one system. So if I turned it on, you would see it would say uh, Macintosh hard drive backup. So it just it backs up these three terabytes on itself to a RAID one, which means there are two disks that are being backed up simultaneously. And then there's a third the third disk you can swap in and out of that drive so that it duplicates a third drive, and then that the the third drive gets there's a third and a second drive. That second drive gets swapped with the third drive. Right second drive goes to off storage so every time you swap it it's making a third copy immediately so it's called a raid one system with a swapped drive um, that's how the all of the working stuff is being backed up mm -hmm. and then when you're when you're done with a job then that job is being you're you're taking that job so you're going to your pictures folder you're grabbing this job so once you're done with this job this job gets copied over to an archive drive, which we plug in, we archive the information, um, and then I use this program, Delta Walker, right here. This program, Delta Walker, you tell it, look at this file, look at that file. So this is the drive, this is the current drive, this one here, and then wherever you've copied it to, you put it here, and then you compare them. So it makes sure that the copy is perfect. Once you know the copy is perfect, then you can delete this one off of this drive here, and it's now on the archive version of the drive. Mm -hmm. And also, during the process of cleaning that up, you remember we put stuff into our portfolio drive. So this portfolio drive is always attached. So this is just an external drive that's always attached that I can then take with me anywhere I go yeah. and utilize that. If I'm, if I'm traveling on the road, I simply go to my Lightroom folder here, and grab this portfolio catalog and copy it over here so that I can work on the road with it. And then when mm -hmm. I get home, I just copy it back over and overwrite this one. Gotcha. So that's that's the basics. There, I mean, there's a lot more that goes into it. That's uh, probably a really shoddy way to show you my uh, backup system, but that, I guess that could be a whole nother um, <laughs> hour worth of, of talking. I mean, it's it's so fascinating you know, like you said, I mean, I think inherently we, we tend to be a little lazy and we sort of bemoan like, oh, has digital made it any easier? But I mean, I periodically still shoot film and dealing with that is 10 times harder. So I guess there's oh, yeah. kind of incentive to, to get the act together. Yeah, I would never, ever, 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 ever shoot film again. Yeah. I, just, I just don't see as much as I think it's a cool art form. It's so fraught with problems, and you have to take a film to a place that could ruin it. In fact, I remember one of the last rolls of film I shot was an engagement portrait, and I took it to the developer, and they ripped the film end to end. So literally, the sprockets on the right and the left side of the film were completely separated from each other with a straight line down the center of the film. It literally, the whole thing, I don't even, I couldn't have cut as as <laughs> down the center as well as they'd ripped it end to end and then they said oh we're so sorry and they said here's a new f roll of film to replace the roll of film that right. we damaged 
and here's a coupon to use us for free next time. And I was like, do you really think I'm going to actually come back here and have you rip my next roll of film? Right. You know, but it's the film is so fraught with problems, and yet digital has this ability to immediately be backed up, have the ability to search things. I used to have this most complicated film system to try and find. You know, I had all of these contact sheets, and then you'd have to go and look for the contact sheets that because you couldn't sort by, you know. Uh, keywords or something because right. how would you know you know what was on this one versus that so you always look you'd say I think it was 2001 so then you'd go find your 2001 book of of contact sheets and search through those and once you found them then you had to go find the negative and then you had to decide to go to the dark room and print it and, yeah oh my gosh <laughs> Well, well we've actually night. run out of time and I you know there's so many questions. Uh I'm going to see if we can bribe Jared offline to to answer some of your questions and we'll post that along with the video tomorrow. And it, I feel like we need to do a, a few more workflow uh webinars with you Jared, so maybe we can schedule that in the future as well. Sure thing. Yeah, I, it's always a it's always sad that you you end up at the end of your hour and and then there's a whole bunch of questions. But yeah, we can we can uh, answer a few questions and post them, I guess. Um, but thank you, Jared, so much for uh, joining us and, and sharing the tips uh, and to the audience for asking some great questions and, and whatnot. I do want to let you know that we have another webinar next week, Tuesday, uh, and that's going to be covering uh, crowdfunding your photo projects. And we have two great photojournalists who have done long-term documentary projects and, and uh, found a way to crowdfund them. One of them is a guy named Chris Capaziello. Uh, who's been photographing his brother who has uh, cystic fibrosis, I believe it is, um, for the past decade or so. And so really interesting stuff. Uh, so if you're looking for a way to, to create a book or whatnot, join us for that webinar as well. And you can always find out about our webinars at photoshelter.com slash about uh, slash webinar, I believe is the, the URL. Um, but Jared, thank you once again for joining us. You are welcome. And thanks to everyone uh, out in the internet in the interwebs out there for, for joining us today as well. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Okay.